only went there and I called the police and they said, if it, has it occurred to you that somebody might still be there? And I thought, no, it hasn't. Yeah, I'll be leaving now. <laughs> that, that would explain why there are bars on the windows now. Oh, they were then too. They could only get <laughs> safe right. halfway across the room. So. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. I feel safe now. <laughs> so we're welcoming our guests. Uh, we'll wait just a minute and then um, I'll say hello and we'll uh, invite Noel to give a profound prayer. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. I'm looking forward to hearing about how you've been and what you've been up to. Good to be back. So welcome everybody. Welcome back. This is a reprise of a panel we had as the pandemic was just beginning. I'll introduce everybody in a moment. Uh, and invite Noel Yorkson to open us with prayer in a moment. But just to say, I'm really thankful to Joe Swimmer and to Seep for their bringing us together over these last months. They've had, you know, Seep has had a conference for its entire history, but over these last several months, they've gathered many more people than have ever gathered together in person in a conference to help us figure out what's happening and to find our next steps uh, for Christ's mission for us together. So as we start, this express gratitude and thanksgiving for Joe and for Seep and for everybody who's helped make these webinars possible over the last months. We're going to begin with prayer from Noel Yorkson. Noel. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, who created all peoples in your image, we thank you for the wonder wonderful diversity of races and cultures in this world. Enrich our lives by ever widening circles of fellowship and show us your presence in those who differ most from us until our knowledge of your love is made perfect in our love for all your children. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you. So let me introduce um, our team that's back together today. First, uh, thanks, Noel York Simmons, for her Rector of Historic Christ Church in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Russell Levinson, uh, Rector of St. Martin's Church in Houston. The Reverend Doy Khan, Rector of Church of the Epiphany in Seattle. And uh, Dr. Eleanor Peters Berquist, who is at St. Louis University in, uh, in St. Louis. Uh, welcome back. Um, I'm Matt Hyde. I'm Rector of Church of the Heavenly Rest in New York City. So some of you were with us during our first panel presentation way back uh, several years ago in March uh, when we talked about how we we're moving to respond to the pandemic. And so we're just joining together today to hear what's happened. The panelists today are from across the country, very different parts of the church and have all in different ways had to respond. And so um, I want to start with the question to the whole group What's it been like? Talk about what's happening now in uh, your communities. Just what's the snapshot if folks were to drop into Alexandria, Houston, uh, Seattle, or St. Louis? What would they see this week? And start with, uh, with Ellie. W what's going on in St. Louis this week and what's happened in your community? I would say it's... Um it's, it's sort of 50-50. I don't know if that's the right percentage, but you've got people who are masking up, people who are keeping six feet distance, people who are using all of the protections. All of the businesses seem to have implemented them. But then you've got what we had um, Memorial Day weekend, which is, is not St. Louis, but um, a few um, miles down the road in the Lake of the Ozarks. There were many, many young people um, at the bars, made the national news, um, not using masks, not social distancing, you know, sort of going about businesses as, as you would if it were a regular um, holiday weekend. So I don't know if other people are seeing that. We, we have pretty much a 50-50. Our, our hospitalizations have been coming down, so that's good. But um, I've been checking, you know, sort of all the graphs, and our graph tends to be more of a W. So we're sort of riding a mini wave of a pandemic in terms of hospitalizations. Um, we go up, we come back down, we go up again. Good. Um, do we uh, how is it in Seattle? What are you experiencing this week in Seattle? Well, S S Seattle, uh, a lot of people on the streets um, every single night. Uh, 
Saturday night was um, surprising. I was down at the protest with my family because uh, we felt that that was an important place to be. And suddenly it, it turned all, you know, like you heard on the news and like so many cities around the nation. Um, and so we went home. But it, uh, uh, the people, but the interesting thing in Seattle, uh, I don't know how many thousands of people were down at that protest on Saturday night, but I maybe saw two people not wearing masks. So, um, you know, masks are very big and, you know, people are, are wearing and in, in, in many parts of the community conscious still of the, of the COVID crisis um, and also uh, deeply uh, d disturbed and involved um, in sort of the revealing uh, um, of, a, of a greater consciousness through the death of George Floyd. So um, a lot of energy around that uh, and um, that's coming out into the streets a lot. Um, so while they're coming out protected, uh, to a certain extent, there's also, they're coming out um, uh, to protest this particular, uh, this and all the, all of the, um, the history behind this. So um, that's what I'd say is life's like in Seattle right now. Russ, what's Houston? What's happening in Houston? Uh, I would say kind of uh, mirror what Eleanor said. I mean, we you either have people who are, very engaged and attentive to the uh, guidelines. Uh, you know, my big outing every day is exercise. So I, we, and I do that outside. And um, I would say three quarters of the people who are biking, running, walking, are, are wearing masks and are honoring that. Um, I think most of the restaurants here that have opened are honoring the guidelines as well. Um, our Fortunately, our hospitals have not filled up, and that's been the that's been the real key for us in making a decision about how we were going to open for public worship. And um, well, I know we're going to come back to that. Um, but in Houston this week, George Floyd's a, a son of Houston, and so um, uh, the activity downtown, which has, with the, with the exception of one night, um, has been very peaceful. And we're people forget Houston is is really a, the latest survey is the most diverse city in the country now 110 languages spoken in our community and um and so you know people here are very used to the diversity and and love that quality and who we are so so while we've had gatherings protests and and, and we're gonna have a lot more leading up to and including george's funeral um mm -hmm. they've been they've been very um, measured and thoughtful and, and and increasingly so i should say Noel, how about Alexandria and Greater Washington? Well, um, I think much like I've heard others say, it seems like the vast majority of people that are out and about in public do seem to be following the rules that have been set forth. Um, folks, I, what I'm seeing in our neighborhoods here in Alexandria is that people that are out um, walking, exercising, running, um, don't tend to wear a mask, but they are practicing fantastic social distancing a lot of like stepping into the street and making sure that everyone's got space um restaurants are using all kinds of creative um and uh interesting ways of, of keeping afloat, um, setting up tables in parking lots to make sure that they have enough space. Um, we are in Northern Virginia, which means that we have been singled out as a section of the state of Virginia that's opening later than the rest of Virginia. Virginia was um, even a little late on the curve to start opening up and Northern Virginia has decided to open up even later. So we're still in the very earliest phases of what we're <clears throat> allowed to do by the governor. Um, and that was wise. Um, I think it's just generally accepted in the area that it was a good choice um, by the folks that I'm around, by my, my congregants. Um, and on top of that, we have this layer of people trying to figure out how to safely get out and hear, make their voices heard. Um, we're right next door to DC, and so we've been watching very closely what's been going on at St. John's Lafayette Square, um, and a lot of my colleagues and a lot of my parishioners um, have headed down that way to show their support, fully masked, fully kitted up with all the, with all the stuff. So I think people are still taking it very seriously. Well, so this is an historic moment. Uh, all our parishes in our parish history is 50 years from now will talk about this time. Um, describe, if you were to write, you know, the first chapter, or maybe the first two chapters in this part of our, of your parish history of, of 
what's happening. How would you, how would you describe what you've done, what it's been like, the shifts that you've made and, and what parish life has been in this moment? Russ, what would you say? Yeah, that's, that's, hang on. Uh, that, that's a tall order. Um, you know, I think at first everybody thought this would only last a little while, not because of anything other than I think that's what our hopes were. And um, I think we found pretty quickly how to adjust, and um, uh, and we did that. We did no virtual worship till this began. And uh, now we're doing it and we'll continue to do it from, from now on. Um, but, you know, I, I, I would say there's a mix between pastoral care that is, um, I would say that's probably become the most important work we have. You know, we have some virtual Bible studies. We're doing daily studies on, from the church and things like that. But the pastoral care has been the most um, uh, important work suddenly. And so we, we made a decision and rounded up vestry and clergy and we called everybody in the church. So about 300, 3000 households. And, uh, and then when we finished, we started over. So we're doing it again. And all of a sudden we got to know people we didn't know. I got to know people I didn't know uh, because we just divvied them up. Um, um, and I, I think for a long season, there was some frustration. There was some uh, angst about, when and how we would return. Mm -hmm. And um, and even now that we are returning, you know, we have people who have been fully supportive of however we do it. I, I, I guess I have found how blessed I am to be here because it seems the response has been so much um, more receptive than I would have ever imagined. Um, and we're in the middle of, of building some things here and one of the things that we decided to do the other day, in addition to lots of other things, is we're going to create some sort of monument that recognizes this year, the deaths this year, uh, the, the, the tectonic plate shift in the culture that 2020 brought to all of us. And I was just having a discussion with somebody about it before we started, um, because we want people to know this was a big shift for us. Um, I will say this. And I said this, we, we announced that we're having a, a very small opening on Sunday. And I, I, again, I know we're going to circle back to that. Um, a lot of us have said things like, uh, you can worship God anywhere. Church really doesn't matter. Buildings don't matter. I've, I've heard that a lot. I've heard it in sermons. I've read it in articles. And, and I agree. God's everywhere. We can pray to him everywhere. Uh, but I'm reminded that Luke chapter 4 said Jesus went to the synagogue as was his custom. And so I think people miss their holy spaces. And so I think the spaces do matter and they're a place of sanctuary where people can withdraw. So I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm eager to return fully whenever that happens. Um, not before it needs to happen, but I'm also not ready to jump on the bandwagon to say church ought to be anywhere. I mean, people, what we hear from our folks are, it, it really is we miss coming to church and seeing our, friends and family, that kind of thing. And I actually think this has played a role to somewhat in the, in the um, distressing um, civil, uh, civil unrest, whatever you want to call it, I mean, of the last few days. I mean, these all, by and large, people's community over the last few months have, have not been, they haven't been in their worship communities. They haven't been having good, helpful, engaging conversations with one another. Their, their community is now social media. And so I think when we're, when we're together as a group with the kind of diversity that Noel prayed for as we began, it smooths down our edges a little bit. And, um, and I do, so I do, I think when we look back, we'll, we'll realize how important church is. Uh, Noel, first draft of history for y'all. Uh, I think the first two chapters, the first two chapters of this, whatever this is, this time, will be titled Fear and Loss. Um, and I think that that's the beginning of what my congregation was feeling, um, is that uh, afraid of what this looks like, afraid for themselves and their families and afraid of, the, of not being together and how long that would go on. Um, and then the loss of those very things that we lean into, what felt like the loss of those very things that we lean into when we're afraid. Um, and the chapters after that go uphill. 
<laughs> they got better. <laughs> um, because I think after that, it turns into um, creativity and patience and willingness. Um, we've got members of our community that had sworn they would never turn on a computer in their lives joining us on Zoom um, and, you know, coming on to church online um, and checking in. Um, and then the creativity of staff and parishioners that um, are doing things that they never knew they could do, never really wanted to try, um, but are now by necessity um, learning to enjoy some new skills. Um, so those are the first, I guess maybe that's the first four chapters right? mm -hmm. um, yeah. of, the, of that history. Um, and it has been, I mean, it's, it's not all sunshine and roses, obviously, at this point. It's not all, things don't feel good yet. Um, it, we have a long way to go. We're only just now starting to dip our toes into um, a long time away future when we will be in our pews. But part of what we're doing in this season, um, this, this season of this season, is figuring out how we, um, how we retool our language um, so that it's not a, we're not um, ranking um, which one is better. Is it better to, to, to worship online? Is it better to be um, in the building? But trying to figure out how we hold those in balance so that we're not saying that um, worship inside Zoom, worship in church online is um, just a mere fac facsimile of what we, what we could do. Um, we're trying to really help, help each other know that this is presence. Um, it's lowercase p and capital P presence um, and that we are together and that we are praying and that we are leaning on each other. Um, we're just doing it in a space that looks very different from the spaces that we're used to. Um, and yeah, we all want to be back in the building. We're pretty invested in our building here at Christ Church. Um, and we're also finding new ways of being together that we're going to we're going to stick, not just for liturgy, but for, um, for meetings and small group and, um, and different kinds of things. So um, that's been the, the thing that I have, that I think that is going to stay with me the longest after this is that, um, that sense of creativity that is just, feels like it's coming out of the woodwork in fantastic ways. Cool. Uh, Ellie, what do you see in your communities? What, what's... Uh... Yeah, What's the sorry. first couple of chapters been like for you? First of all, let me say that I really like Noel's chapters analogy. And I was thinking, well, what would my analogy be? And I think that I would first like to say before we go any further that so much of what's happening with um, our new protests and our new protest um, unrest and culture is the COVID situation and the um, the unrest and the, and the, the, the discomfort with um, everything that's happening on a civil level from um, George Floyd's unfortunate um, passing, they're inextricably linked. So COVID and public health is social justice. I mean, if you look at the individuals who are have the highest mortality rates, not only just in terms of numbers, but in terms of um, per population, it's um, people of color and minority communities. So these two things are in many ways the same thing. Um, and it's about the social determinants of health and the justice of individuals who, you know, don't have access to healthcare or, you know, telehealth, all the, you know, working from home, all the things that we sitting here, um, the, the five of us are enjoying probably right now. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing that I would think of that my metaphor would be almost probably the chrysalis there's an extraordinary amount of pain across the country right now, not just because of COVID and, and George Floyd. People have lost their jobs. They, they've lost their identities. They've lost their places of worship, which I agree are important. Uh, you know, I was very much on the forefront of, you know, like you got to Zoom, you know, it, it's not forever. It just has to be temporary. It's a new way of doing things and you have to embrace it. Um, but you do get to come back together. And like what Russ said, it, it is a lot longer than people thought and it will be potentially longer still. So I have my eye on the prize for January, um, but I'm perfectly uh, capable of understanding that it might not be, it might not be January. Um, so I think that emerging, you know, coming back to the metaphor of emerging from the chrysalis is extraordinarily painful. Yeah. Uh, it will produce something beautiful. It will produce something entirely new and wonderful, but I think we're in that process of, um, of discovery, of pain, um, 
and coming up is beauty. Mm -hmm. I hope. Yeah. Do I? Well, uh, how do you I write that? I said this last time, but you know, I, we call this at uh, Epiphany the time of the great time out when all of humanity was called to go sit in the corner and think about what they've done, uh, just like I do with my children. And so the interesting thing about it um, that has sort of come to my mind is the thing that we have been given collectively to consider uh, by God and the movement of the Holy Spirit, I don't know how, is the image of George Floyd, right? So when we went into time out, we had something to look at, we had something to think about, uh, maybe we didn't quite know what it would be. Now we know what it is. Now, he's not the first African-American man to be killed on a, a video screen. But he is the first one to have been killed when we were all sitting at home wondering why we were in time out. And I think it's the sin of racism and institutional racism and slavery um, that we are called to collectively consider in the time of this great time out. So, so that I found to be profound, a profound image given to everybody at the same time as we were being asked, forced to sit inside and consider what we, did, we, what we had done. So I hope there's a shift and not something that is forgotten because of our collective experience of this, because of our collective suffering uh, from COVID, uh, that there might be a deeper link to the suffering of African Americans in this country. So, so that's, that's the great time out that that I'm writing and thinking and talking about with our congregation. Uh, when I wonder, what I see that's happened with us is we're running at the speed of the Holy Spirit. I mean, this is the age of the Holy Spirit, right? And uh, this is a new time. And so at Epiphany, uh, we've been thinking about a couple of things very differently. First of all, who is our congregation? Um, and that has changed, right? The nature of church has changed. Uh, we are becoming intensely local and universally connected. In a, in a new way. Now, we've always been connected. People could always come and watch Epiphany online on Sundays, but now they are. Now they're, uh, now they're coming and connecting to us. So we have many different congregations now that we hadn't thought about before. We have our congregation that has been forced to watch our online services at home because they can't collect the church. We have what I call our expatriate congregants who have returned, people that live in Philadelphia or New York or Florida, who have sort of found their way back to the epiphany they once had experienced when they lived in Seattle. We have our in absentia congregation, which is our congregation that goes to Palm Springs or to Sun Valley or wherever they go in the winter, who have connected more vigorously because of all of the things we're doing online. Our online presence is just, you know, daily videos, daily concerts, Bible teachings, like things that we hadn't been doing. We have this congregation collecting in a way that they hadn't. And then we have a, a congregation that's finding their way to epiphany that's never been to Seattle. Right? So, so all of a sudden we have these different congregations that we're engaging um, that we hadn't thought about prior to COVID. And then we wonder how do we engage them? So if you have um, worship, I think about worship in three ways in a way that we hadn't before. The first is just transferring, taking what we did on Sunday and live streaming it. So we do that and we do that as well as we can um, in the sanctuary with a limited choir uh, spaced out appropriately. Uh, the second thing is how do we translate what we had done online? So that sort of involves pre-programming things, cutting differently, editing it differently, you know, taking our choir, putting them in squares, you know, having them record things at home, you know. So that is, that's translating uh, something that everybody's familiar with. And then the third thing is how are we providing transformed liturgy, things we'd never done before as a way of paying attention to what our congregation's paying attention to. So one thing we've done is we've gone on YouTube and looked at our analytics and looked at what people were looking at and what they were interested in. And then we're, we're developing worship services to sort of accommodate how they see us online. So, so I think the great time out has reformulated our relationship with congregations and what it means to be parish. So I think two things will happen with parishes. One, hyperlocality right? People wanting to be in their church, in their neighborhood, with their friends, and a growth of that. And then also, and so we still have to pay attention to Sunday school and choir, youth group, and all of the outreach and all of the things we do. But also, now when people listen to Epiphany's choir online, they're also listening to St. Martin's in the Field or Westminster Abbey. Or, you know, so, so it's no longer comparing us to the neighborhood church down the street. It's thinking about our choir in relationship to the National Cathedral or my preaching in, in relationship to, you know, T.G. Jakes or, you know, a great TED Talk. So suddenly 
we have to think, you know, we're not just thinking about who we're talking to locally, we're thinking about our universal relationship. Uh, now we're in a parish that has zero boundaries. Um, and so, so those are shifts that we're looking at, how we worship, right? Local, uh, you know, hyper-locality and universal connectivity. We're looking at uh, how the great timeout has changed uh, what we need to be uh, uh, readily attending to with regards to reconciliation over the long arc, right? I think it's very easy, and we've seen it over and over, forgetting, right, the systematic, the systemic racial injustices that, that our culture has. So that's been called out in a new way, touching us in a new way. So I think we had all that stuff wrapped up. That's like chapter one. No, that's, but those are the things we're thinking about. And this will be the moment in time in which all that shifted. Thank you. And I will come back to um, how are y'all planning for, for what's next, for the next chapters, including return to in-person worship. You know, what gives you hope and, and how you're engaging what's happening in the world. And as Ellie said, is revealed what's been happening uh, for a long time. But we're joined today by so many folks who are leaders across the church, either clergy or lay leaders, um, who are trying to take care of, of church themselves and to, and to be leaders in this moment. So I want to ask you kind of personally about your own ministries and your own leadership. And to start with kind of what's fed you in this time? Um, what surprised you? And then I want to hear, Ellie said something that I've held on to since our first conversation about this will present as a health crisis or as an economic crisis but it's an emotional crisis. And so emotional resilience is an important piece of this. I want to hear how you're caring for yourself because that's something all of us were thinking about. But start with um, what's fed you during this time um, as, as leaders of communities in communities and what surprised you. Noel. Um, I am finding myself most fed by my colleagues. Um, particularly both my colleagues here at Christchurch, my um, clergy colleagues here at Christchurch, um, but also colleagues that I have in, um, in an official colleague group that I meet with regularly. They used to be less frequently and more now it is more frequently um, as we meet on Zoom to help each other um, both with idea making, but also with that emotional support that you're talking about. Um, I also have uh, colleague friends all over the country that, again, we're doing some of the, the idea making, how are you all handling this one situation? Am I crazy or did this really happen? And also, how is everyone? How are you doing? Um, and those kinds of uh, support network is so, is so kind of cliche, but um, those kinds of relationships um, have been, have always been important to me and have been deeply, deeply important to me in the last three months um, as we um, as we talk to each other and we keep each other accountable and we listen while each, while we cry um, and we we make sure that nobody is kind of falling off falling off the cliff of of whatever this is on any given day um, and and uh, having a place to say this has been a really, really bad day. Um, and I don't know if I can do this again tomorrow. And then having someone say back to me, you can do it again tomorrow, but tell me what happened today. Some of that's like a therapist role, right? But we're also, we are all, the, my clergy colleagues and I are all doing the same thing um, all the time. So being able to lean in that way has been um, profoundly important to me. Um, so yeah, so that's my, I think that's my number one self-care piece. I mean, there are other things too, like, ice cream and long distance running, but <laughs> those are the, that's probably the biggest one. <laughs> so Russ, what's fed you in this time and what surprised you? Um, as I heard, was, was listening to Noel, I was thinking before I talk about what's fed me, I have to name the, the reality that, um, that it has been a very painful time. So, um, I, I've had to spend a lot more time being fed. Um, mm -hmm. We've had probably like most of you, I think we've had 15 deaths uh, in the last eight weeks and no funerals. Uh, we've had gravesides, um, but we have people now who are waiting for funerals. And so uh, the, the grief and doing pastoral care over the phone is not the way I like to do it. Uh, doing last 
you know, prayers at the time of death over the phone is not what I, I'm used to doing. Uh, I, so those things have been a very tough, painful moment for me. Of my four adult children, three have been laid off, not furloughed, laid off. Um, and uh, so what's going on economically is very real in my home. Um, and so we're having a big circle up with the family in about 10 days just to plan the strategy because we don't know what it will look like months out. So, I mean, kind of naming those things um, is an important part of realizing I, I've, I've, uh, I'm fortunate to be been married over 35 years to somebody who's still my best friend. And we just today, I mean, al almost every day now, we don't normally exercise together when we're at work. So we're doing that. We almost every day we're doing that together. We're spending a lot more time together and, um, and it's still going okay. There are days when we go, and she's about three weeks ago, she came out and said, I guess this is what retirement's going to be like. So, um, um, uh, so I, I'm very fed by the time I've been able to spend with my wife. Um, but I'm, I'm an extrovert by nature. And so this whole experience is like sandpaper on my personality. And, you know, so every day I've had to kind of grow in that. But the good part of that is it's, it's put me on my knees more. Uh, it's put me in a lot more silence than I normally have. And, um, and, and suddenly the pace, which probably for all of us, which seems unrelenting at times, um, the fact that it's not unrelenting is not a big problem for me anymore. You know, I, I like the slower pace. It would probably be hard to pick back up. Um, and staying as Noel, but you know, I've, I've, we're having Zoom gatherings with friends and, uh, and, and our clergy and team and folks in the parish and vestry, all that matters. But I, I, I think it really, it has reminded me, I think I, think I might have mentioned this in our first get together, um, that the old, old spiritual disciplines of prayer and solitude and study really do feed the soul. So. Thank you. Dwight, what's fed you, what's surprised you? Well, um, boy. Uh, I have to say, you know, um, my, my wife is a physician, and so she's continued to go to work, and, and yeah. she's very involved uh, at work. Um, and my, my son's uh, been at home uh, with me. And, you know, I go back and forth to the church, you know, sort of all by myself there, all by myself at home, uh, you know, because of uh, what, what's going on. But I've loved having him around. And uh, uh, the family, we, we've divided up cooking. My daughter's in college, and she comes home and cooks twice a week and my son cooks you know, we have these family meals like we haven't had uh, regularly uh, for a long time. I love that. Um, uh, so that's been getting together with uh, old friends, communities that have gathered. My college uh, roommates are now meeting on Zoom. I mean, we haven't, you know, been out of college for 30 years and somebody pulled that together. It's been lovely. So reconnecting with old friends. Um, but also, or else, like you said, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing a daily Bible study. I do a weekly Bible study. My study life has increased. My prayer life um, uh, hasn't increased really, but it's been renewed and enriched and very specific, you know, in my conversation with God about all the folks in my congregation. And so that's been, um, that's been, that's been great, I guess. And, and the other thing that's happened is I call up the folks, you know, call, put on my earphones and call up folks and you don't just call up, you know, to arrange something or make a meeting or something. You talk for an hour on the phone, right? I, I love that. It's just so great. And then I can, you know, combine it with walking around. So I get a little exercise at the same time. And um, so those, have, those things have fed me, the study, the prayer, the family, long conversations. Um, what's really surprised me is how much I miss the congregation and, and sort of how the ground feels weird under my feet. Who's gone? Who haven't I talked to? What's going on? What have I missed? You know, um, who am I not thinking about? Uh, and and that's, that's, that shook me a little bit, right? That's, what's our community going to be like uh, when we come back together? Uh, and, um, and so, so that's, you know, that's, I guess I, 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 I'd never thought about not having that. So it's, it's just surprising how much I, I miss that. And how insecure I am, I have to say, and how insecure I am about that. You know, what is that going to be like? Yeah. I would say for me, um, the weather is a big deal. 
when we first got together in March and at least in St. Louis, it was, you know, raining all the time. And it just was like, it was like one thing after another, so depressing and, and just the sunshine. I mean, I feel like all across the U S we're getting more, you know, we're getting more sunshine. We've got longer hours in the day. And I feel like that's very uplifting, at least for me personally. Um, the thing that I'm probably most surprised about is that I, by nature, I'm somebody that likes to divest and likes to divest things. And I, um, I like to have a really clean, a clean surface of life, if you will. And I've been surprised at how I have been forced into so much divestiture um, that has not been in my control. Um, my whole social life has been divested. <laughs> um, so many, you know, the workplace has been divested. Many people have, you know, as Russ said, lost their jobs. That has been divested. So that introspective process of trying to figure out what is the core of me? What do not only, what do I not need, but what do I not want to put back? And so I've started to have some of those sort of like conversations with myself about what, what do I want moving forward? And I guess my last thing that I would say is I used to have, I, I quit a job, had a new baby, started a PhD, did all this in, you know, like three months. And I had this saying that change is like a muscle. The more you use it, uh, the stronger it becomes. And now I feel like uncertainty is like a muscle. The more you're faced with it, uh, the more you use it to your advantage, the more comfortable you become. I'm writing that down. <laughs> that's that's it may come up in a future homily, Ellie. Uh, follow up on Eleanor. We, yeah, and, yeah, there's, uh, we're all taking sermon notes right now, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> we absolutely are. <laughs> but, but what Eleanor just said, I, 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 honestly, the commercials are driving me nuts, of course. And, and almost everyone begins with, in these uncertain times. And I, and I use that as an example. I said, what times <laughs> are certain? Tell me what times are certain. But it's a really good point to remind uh, those of us charged to speak to our folk every week, there is one thing that is certain, the love of God, the presence of God always, at all times, in all places. But pretty much everything else is uncertain. <laughs> so this is a big uncertain. It's like the big time out, Deutsch said. But, um... Well, y'all have already mentioned uh, George Floyd and the response to his murder across the country. Ellie mentioned the inequality and how the pandemic has hit all of our communities. Um, would you describe how y'all's communities, as, as you care for each other, connect to each other, are also engaging the wider world at this moment, uh, which is um, suffering as our own people um, within our parishes are suffering? How are you engaging right now? Joy? Well, uh, after I, uh, Saturday night, the, the, before the Feast of Pentecost on Sunday, uh, we came home from the protest I was telling you about. Um, and one of the blessings of our knowledge of Zoom now and our capacity to connect to the congregation, I had a congregation-wide meeting on Zoom that night at 8 o'clock. Uh, and uh, got folks, you know, who, you know, so not our whole congregation, because frankly, it's a short, short, short uh, lead time. Uh, but, but being together and hearing uh, how folks were feeling right in that moment as Seattle was burning, windows were being broken and people were raging all over the streets. Uh, we got together and, and we now have a tool uh, that people are used to using that allows us to gather. That's very important um, for our congregation. Um, that's, that's one. The second thing is uh, many voices have, uh, you know, a lot of leadership, you know, I have a lot of ideas as to what we can do, but leadership that works, of course, is people that step forward and say, I want to lead on a particular thing. Um, and so some conversation groups using sacred ground um, have uh, blossomed up all over the place. And we're going to sort of wander into that in the very near future. Um, so those, those specifically with regards to George Floyd, those are things that have happened. Um, but with regards to the greater community, our outreach uh, to, you know, continue to have homeless people sleep at Epiphany, uh, continue and increase uh, our food ministry at, at, to the wider community, that's vigorous um, and, and an important part of what we're doing. Uh, so those are a few things um, that we're doing. The, the final thing is, is we're gathering, um, again, through, we have a, a decent database, uh, we're gathering neighborhood groups. So we're building all of these sort of cells of epiphany all over the uh, region that we always knew were there. But again, because of the stay-at-home order, we're able to call them together. So we're building relationships.
within our congregation in their own neighborhoods all over the greater Seattle area, um, which, you know, to give sort of a sense of um, that intimacy that's really close to them uh, with people that they didn't even know lived in their neighborhood. So that's another thing we've been doing. Good. Noelle, how about y'all? How have you been able to be engaged? Um, so we're in this, again, I mentioned earlier, we're in this weird, like there, but not quite there space, um, right across the river from, um, mm -hmm. Washington, um, at a time when a lot of, I mean, some, but limited, um, actual physical traffic is going back and forth. Um, mm -hmm. and so my congregation has been asking for what it looks like to, you know, what are some guidance for going over and protesting and some of them are doing it, um, particularly at St. John's Lafayette Square. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's some of that just day-to-day -day kind of stuff happening. Um, we're also, again, we're in, so, so we're right next to DC, right? But we're also in Virginia, <laughs> which has its own um, uh, conversations that have been going on since roughly the 1860s. Um, and trying to navigate through what those, uh, what those conversations mean for a parish like ours. Um, we got hit um, pretty hard when we entered into some of those conversations about a monument that we had ourselves um, here um, at Christ Church. That was about two years ago. Um, and so we've been in a healing process since then um, and realized kind of last Advent that it was about time for us to really start digging deep um, and having some, some larger parish conversations. So we've been setting up to do sacred ground. Um, the plan was to do it at the end of the summer, this, this summer. Um, and we're still sticking to that, but we're also going to be doing um, some more short-term conversations starting this Sunday about um, what it means to be a largely white, um, largely middle and upper middle class uh, congregation here in affluent Northern Virginia, um, what it means for us to listen and just sh stop talking, stop putting our narrative in front of um, some of the other narratives that we're hearing right now that are cries of pain um, and cries of frustration and cries of deep anger, 400 years of anger and pain and frustration, and that we're going to start doing some work on learning to listen um, <clears throat> without our opinions and task forces and um, ideas and uh, needs um, going in front of that. So that's going to be, we're putting that together kind of quickly, but um, first, and then we'll start working on sacred ground stuff later um, in the year. Um, we also joint, I'm not sure that this for us really fits into the um, George Floyd uh, um, protest situation, but we also have been running our, um, some of our core outreach ministries, all of our core outreach ministries have, um, have been turned up to 11. Um, and we've been serving huge numbers of people, um, both food and financial assistance um, in, again, here's this word again, creative and intentional and amazing ways. Um, putting all the things into place, all the distancing, all that. And it means that we've been coming up with new pathways for that, um, that wouldn't have occurred to us, um, three, four months ago. Um, and we're reaching more people and we're being, we're able to do that. Um, unfortunately, the way that it does connect to the conversations, um, about the, the protests against the murder of George Floyd and the conversations that were, are going on nationally about people of color, um, and those narratives is that the largest number of people that we serve in these ministries are people of color because in Northern Virginia, that's the people who needs the most, um, the most uh, financial and food assistance. Um, and so we need to start engaging those conversations as well. Um, we've been very faithful in service and not terribly faithful in conversation. So step two. Hmm. Russ, how about y'all? Yeah, um, look like? You know, I'm in a, I might be in a different place than where some of you serve. I'm in a pretty bright red state. And, um, and so we, we recognize that. And so the, what I'm trying to do in the midst of the discussion around institutional racism and discrimination um, and what we've seen is, I like what Noel just said, 
is move to the deeper conversations, not set up another task force, not to have another group, but uh, and try to get people because it's quickly morphed here into uh, a political, not a, uh, a question about polit about what we need to be talking about, but political divide. And so, I, you know, I have um, people, as many of us were, who were astounded at the photo op and um, have very strong feelings about that. And, um, uh, and then I have, very, I have people who think that that was the best thing in the world. I have people who reached out to me, frankly, very upset with uh, Bishop Buddy and, um, and to some degree the presiding bishop. And so I've, I've taken about three days to prepare a statement back to, the, back to my church and my community to say that I know Bishop Buddy and I know Bishop Curry and I admire them and have prayed with them and they prayed for me and, um, and we need to hear the deeper conversation and just divest ourselves of the political divide, which seems to be, that seems to be where things have quickly raced here. Uh, it's, about, it's, it's about who's in office or who has authority, who's been elected. So I'm trying to move the conversation into the basic social <laughs> responsibility. We all have to love our neighbor and find out who that neighbor is. The color at St. Martin's has actually changed since I've been here in the last 12 years, and that's because we're a di diverse city. Uh, so it's not as, you know, and that's been a very good thing for our members here. Um, so uh, to that piece, I want to keep moving the conversation to the real issues and not the surface ones uh, that tend to inflame our, our passions too much. The other thing is that we, like all of our churches, we're very committed to outreach, but the primary way we've been able to support that, we usually don't uh, support ministries where we don't have boots on the ground, but most of them have shut down except for those on the front lines of hunger and, and um, extreme poverty and things like that. So we, we really postponed kind of, giving to ministries that were not on the front line, reaching out to the underserved. And so we, we uh, have collected a lot of money and, and we go visit those ministries and support them in that way. And we have a COVID relief fund and people have given very generously to that. And, and so we're kind of divvying that up. But, but again, um, to, the, to the folks who are hungry on the street, unemployed, that's where that support is going. Right. Ellie, what do you see in terms of engagement? Um, well, I mean, in terms of engagement, if I can, if I just stay on the, the COVID side for a minute, and I can't remember if I said this before, but shelter in place, what we all did for the past few months, that's, in terms of public health, that's the end of the road. There's nothing bigger than what we just did. There's no other um, greater sacrifice, no other greater social um, non-pharmaceutical intervention that we can put in place. Usually when you have a pandemic and, and they're usually, you know, a couple of century actually in terms of flu, usually about three, not usually coronavirus, but usually you ramp up into shelter in place. We didn't do that. We went zero to 100 immediately. I remember the day when San Francisco and then um, Seattle went to shelter in place. And I told my husband, I was like, this is a big deal. This is a really big deal. And it didn't turn out to be, um, sort of as catastrophic as, as, as it's supposed to be. But what that means is that, I mean, it was catastrophic. The pandemic was catastrophic, but I mean, like people accepted it. They did it. I can't believe they did it, but they did. Um, but what that means for all of us is that we didn't teach people how to go into shelter in place. We didn't teach people all the different strategies that we're now using to come out of shelter in place. We just went to the top of the mountain. And now we've got to figure out how to come back out. Yes. And so I think there's a big education piece in trying ex to explain to people all of the non-pharmaceutical interventions. So a pharmaceutical intervention is a vaccine or a treatment, et cetera, but the mask, the social distancing, um, the, the barriers that you see in restaurants, the tables is six feet apart, et cetera, the drive-by parties. I don't know if you guys have had any of those where you know everybody's honking, et cetera. All of these different things people are learning, but we also have a responsibility, you, and, you know, as clergy and in your congregations have a responsibility to help people understand them and to teach people um, all of these things that really we should have taught them before we went to shelter in place. Mm. So it's not really people's fault that it's hard to understand or, you know, they, they might not be engaging with it because we never taught them how. Right. 
um, and we didn't necessarily explain the importance of them to begin because we went right to shelter in place. So that's the engagement I'm beginning to see and feel like we need more of is um, the public health engagement, but also the educational piece. Here's why. I protect you, you protect me. Uh, I protect your grandparents, you protect my grandparents. Yes. Um, I might have an underlying health condition, you might have an underlying health condition. We can't know these things. So it's that community um, that is that's perfect for what you do. Yes. Well, well so uh, we've got um, just a couple minutes left. And so I wanted to, to draw on what, what Ellie just wanted us to think about. Um, all of us are thinking about, and so many people who have joined us are thinking about this return to safe in-person gatherings. And if it's for y'all like it's for us, is uh, these meetings are not short and, and the answers are not simple. Um, but if you had to give one piece of advice for the wider church or people wrestling with how to return to this within their own churches or institutions, what's the one piece of advice you'd give? What's, what's the thing that you've learned you'd, you'd share? Russ, go ahead. Uh, working with the other clergy in the area has been very helpful. Uh, Barclay Thompson's a friend of mine. He's the dean of our cathedral. Uh, you know, the, the other churches, I mean, we stay in touch weekly. What are y'all doing? How are you going to do it? And, and we bounce ideas off of each other. We've been given a lot of very, not only very helpful, but very clear direction from the bishop. So there's certain things we can and can't do, and, and, and they're beyond our decision making. Um, but within that context, we're still able to talk with one another. And that's been, if, if you ask what's the, the most helpful, really, that's, that's been very helpful to stay engaged with the other clergy. And also, we're trying to do it all at the same time. So nobody's trying to get in front of one another. So. Um, Doik, what's some um, piece of advice? You know, for us, we've been, our bishop uh, has been great and, and really in lockstep with our governor. Um, so that's made it easy for us to sort of think about uh, how we go back uh, to church and open up in relationship to the stages uh, of opening up. Um, but the one thing that I've realized and in, in, in that we're going to pursue pretty heavily is even when we can go back, there's going to be a, 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 a community of parishioners who don't feel comfortable coming back yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's good and right and super appropriate. Um, and when we come back, we'll be wearing masks, right? And we, or at least at, at the beginning, our bishop said we can't distribute communion. Um, we'll be social distancing within our spaces. Uh, our choir and whether or not they sing will look different. Whether or not we have hymns will look different. And so as a result, our live stream will look fundamentally different. So for those folks that can't come, decide not to come, um, we're also pre-recording a service that um, is sort of translates uh, a live service for them with choir, with music, um, you know, with the same kind of pomp that, that we can do in our live streams that we won't be doing when we originally uh, come back together in our church. So we're thinking about that community that won't be able to come back and how we care for them liturgically, even while we open up our church for those who, who want to come back. So that's, that's a little bit, you know, how we're thinking on this. Try and mute, Matt. Noel, what's your piece of advice? Thank you. Um, I'm struggling with this one. Uh, so a couple of things. Um, listen to your congregation, obviously. I mean, that's what we do, right? We listen to our congregations. Um, and uh, one of the conversations that I've been having with our, our liturgy guild, who's the, the head of all the various worship guilds we're using to help plan what the next steps might be, um, is what things do we hold dear about worship? What, is, what do we worship for? Who do we worship? Why do we worship? What is important about worship? And we're having those conversations first so that when we come back together, we're not coming back together just because we love the building and we have to be back in it. We're coming back together in a way that um, maintains the integrity of who we are as people of God and why we worship together. If we have to come back, it, it's sort of like, this is, a, this is a hard way to put it. So this is not the way I would maybe necessarily like put it in writing. But um, if we have to come back under such strict guidelines about who is allowed in the building and how many and what age they have to be and, and, and once you're cut off, you're cut off and like that, 
we have lost something really fundamental about who we are and why we come together to worship. And my worship group that I'm talking with has said, we'd rather wait um, a little bit longer until we can come back together, understanding that there will be strictures, understanding that there have to be boundaries, but making sure that the boundaries that we have to put in place are boundaries that we can live with as people of God. Um, and as followers of Jesus Christ, who believe in welcome, and that everyone should should be should be able to be in this room. Not everyone, but everyone, right? Um, and so we're having those conversations prior to the practical conversations about making sure the pew books are out and how are we going to have bulletins and not have bulletins and masks and choirs and um, that will all come. The other thing that we did that was a great gift to ourselves as a church, we're following our bishop. Bishop Susan Goff has been an absolute rock star of a leader in this but we have decided that we're not come we're not even considering coming back into the building until the end of june um, which means that we have a, a date specific time that we can use to plan and think um, now we might not go back into the building at the beginning of july but we know for sure that we're going to be online until the end of june so we have those we still have that time which also allows the clergy the space to plan thoughtfully rather than, oh my gosh, what's, when is it going to happen? Is it week to week? Is it next week? Is it when? Um, and so in the next week or so, we'll start discussing whether or not we need to add another month onto that, but we're doing it in larger chunks rather than trying to hang on by our fingernails. So those are the things that have worked for us here, listening to the congregation, making sure that we're going back in a way that holds the integrity of the community and what we believe for community, and also giving ourselves the space to um, to really um, worship well and know when those markers are going to be. Ellie, I, I want to end today with where we started last time with your um, admonition about emotional resilience and sustainability. One of the questions in the very good question in the chat was about feeling overwhelmed. And um, I think all, all of us have said that we've faced significant loss and in, in change. What's your, what's your piece of advice for the leaders, or the leaders on our panel, but the, the leaders who have joined us today in their communities for, for how, to, how to handle that sense of overwhelm in this moment? It sounds pat, but from my professional expertise and my professional opinion, telling you that this is not forever. This won't be forever. It just feels like forever. Um, and I think helping to remind your congregations that God's love is forever. Um, and this is, again, feels like forever, but is actually not going to have been that long. So it's a hard thing to put in your mind, but it, it really, a year, a year and a half, it won't be forever. Ellie, thank you. Um, thanks to all of you. Thanks to uh, Noel, Russ, Russ, Doit, and Ellie. Um, before we go, actually, this one, Russ is about to publish a book. Um, and now Russ, which is this, tell me, um, tell us about, is this your, um, is your first or you, you've written things before? Uh, yeah, I'm working with church publishing. Um, and, um, I do, I've written four seasonal devotionals, one for the summertime, which has come out, just called bits of heaven. There you go. Uh, and then one for the fall and it's called a uh, place of shelter one for the Advent season that will be coming out in the fall called Preparing Room, and one for the Lenten season uh, that's called A Path to Wholeness. I had to think. I'm in the middle of finishing the edits on that. But Church Publishing picked them up. I had done them kind of locally and worked with them on redoing them, and they've, they've all come out in the last um, – the first two have come out just in the last few weeks, right at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, but the, the – um, uh, 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 Bits of Heaven is a summer devotional. They each have about 40 devotionals in them, kind of daily devotionals uh, around the season itself. So there you go. Well, thank you all. Uh, Noel just offered in chat, I think, what we all like to offer, which is to be supportive and helpful, um, if we can, to each other, to the wider church. Uh, the panelists talked about how um, support and care from colleagues making a difference to all of us. And so I think and I know Seath is doing that. Joe's uh, been such a leader in helping us do that for each other. We'd like to do that too. So thank you all for joining today. Thanks to everyone who's been part of the conversation. We're forward to continuing this um, in the chapters and months to come. Thanks, Joe. Thank, thank, thank you, Matt. Thank you so much, everybody. God bless. Mm -hmm.
Thank you.